So this will be, I think, a zostra free talk. Um, but I just want to point out to you, be quiet on it, that it's not a Zen free talk, because like so many others of us in the audience and who've been speaking this morning, um, this has just been a profoundly shitty week, um, to put it in my usual terms. And I think a lot of us who were planning on writing a very coherent um, and engaging talk this week suddenly found ourselves um, on Tuesday evening unable to sleep and on Wednesday completely unable to function and trying to support our friends and each other, whether it was with donuts or crying or hugs. Um, and I think it's important, as all of us know, to reflect a bit on what our jobs are um, besides supporting each other. And one thing I think profoundly happened to many of us of a certain generation is this view from Apollo 17 um, of the Earth. And it's a profoundly blue, it's a profoundly small place. And I think we need to remind ourselves, many of us are marine scientists, um, how important it is to remind the world and ourselves every day what a small planet is we live on. Um, that it's highly interconnected by the movements of people, um, and those movements of people um, over the history of humans on this planet are deeply reflected now in our genomes, and we know it, and we can't erase it, and we can't hide behind it. That the movement of airplanes, the movement of, sh or, uh, the movement of ships on the lower left, the movement of airplanes on the upper right, and the movement of the currents in the sea occur at many scales, in many temporal dimensions, and they connect us all. I think if there's one lesson we have to learn and to teach the rest of the world and remind everybody who we know from day to day is that we're all part of this one big, huge challenge of keeping our planet functioning, and that there's nobody who can ignore it, really. He may think he can and separate us out, but he can't really. Okay, so what this talk won't be about. This talk won't be about connectivity and estimating population structure in the sea using genetic markers. There were a bunch of talks over the last few days about that, um, and there will be many, many talks beginning at 10.30 this morning in a session that I'm co-chairing or I'm chairing um, that use genetics to estimate population connectivity. There'll be a little bit there, but not much in the talk today. And it also won't be about a very popular endeavor now, which is linking variation at the DNA or RNA level to variation in traits related to fitness. I think that's a hugely important challenge that modern molecular tools are for the first time beginning us to sort of start understanding the relationships between patterns of genetic variation, function, and spatial variation and temporal variation and selection. But I'm gonna talk very little if you're about that explicitly today. And instead what I wanna talk about are three examples where I think modern molecular genetics has provided some really crucial insights into some backwaters of marine natural history. Places where I like to mess around because I like to get dirty and stay out of other people's ways, but a lot of people aren't, and I think there are important challenges for us in using molecular tools to begin to understand um, natural history, parts of natural history that I think are important in uh, local dynamics and global dynamics of individuals, populations, communities, and ecosystems. So the first part of the talk will concern love the one you're with and how mating systems operate in the sea. And for the most part, as you'll see, we're pretty much guessing how mating systems are structured in the sea. And I'll come back to what I think some of the consequences are and the only example that I'll give from my own work today. Um, and then I want to talk about microbiomes and especially symbionts and the nutritional niche. And I think, you know, what I always worry about is on my tombstone, if there is one, or on my cloud of ashes that someone throws into the ocean, someone's going to say, you studied the wrong thing, Rick. You studied what you thought was the organism, but it was the holobiome, the microbiome, plus the multicellular thing that really is the unit of adaptation. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some examples from Nigerian symbioses and some of the how we're moving that forward to try and understand better how Nigerians might be responding to various scales of environmental variation in space and time. And then third, I'm gonna talk about what I call the silent majority, and that's the biology of rarity in the sea. There's a huge ascertainment bias in everything we study and everything we think we understand in the sea, and in fact, in all of the terrestrial and marine world. 
because as you'll see in the most diverse ecosystems, most species by definition have to be rare. And it's extraordinarily difficult to get money to, to study them. There are some ethical issues actually with studying them too. You know, you gotta tell people where you studied them and then people wanna go see them. And then, you know, this idyllic place that houses the last 10 or the only 10 of some particular species um, is then trampled and destroyed. It's also some challenges, as I'll talk about, in sampling those organisms and developing methods that are non truly non-destructive so that we can begin to unravel which species are really truly rare, how long have they been rare, and what can they tell us about preserving biodiversity. So those are the three components of my talk today. So Love the One You're With, that is the title, I think, of a paper that Morgan Kelly and Eric Sanford and I wrote a few years ago about mating systems and barnacles. But we know remarkably little, actually, about mating systems in the sea. Don Levitan and I were talking about this the other day. He wrote me a foaming at the mouth rant email saying, you know, we don't know anything about this. And I said, you're right, we hardly know anything about mating systems in the sea. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about what we do know about mating systems in the sea, or at least what I've been trying to understand about mating systems in the sea, and why I think they're important. So briefly, a mating system concerns the patterns of mating in a population. And so there are promiscuous mating systems in which just about everybody mates with everybody else. And in primates, that's typically, in, in apes at least, gibbons. There are polygynous mating systems in which one male mates with many females. There are a lot of examples of, about of those in primates, including gorillas. There are polyandrous mating systems in which one female mates with many males, as in caltrichid monkeys. And then there are monogamous mating systems, which are actually exceedingly rare now that we have the genetic tools to look at mating systems and not just sort of behave, make the behavioral observations, but genetically confirm who actually is mated with whom. And at least in most chimp populations, they're remarkably monogamous mating systems. And the question is, how many marine organisms could we classify by mating system? And the answer I would say, you could probably count mm, on two hands, um, but it's hard to really estimate. But certainly nothing like we understand in terrestrial systems for birds and mammals and insects like that. Now, this isn't going to be on the exam, but the idea here is just to point out that mating system variation has profound impacts on many ecological phenomena, including type, offspring size variation, which in turn will influence variation performance, competitive ability, resistance to predators. Offspring size variation influences dispersal, which in turn influences demography and population dynamics. And offspring size variation will also influence rules of, uh, or patterns of community composition and the dynamics of community assembly, depending upon how organisms are related to each other with respect to size. Mating systems also have really important impacts on gene flow, the distribution of genetic variation in space and time, and the evolution of hybrid compatibilities, which in turn will have a strong influence on responses to selection and potentially the evolution of reproductive isolation. Mating systems also influence, as Don and others will tell you, gamete traits, patterns of reproductive allocation and reproductive behaviors, which in turn will influence sexual conflict and also the evolution of reproductive isolation and speciation in the sea. And then finally, mating system variation influences patterns of relatedness and levels of family conflict, which in turn influences the evolution of parental care, sib conflict, and offspring size. So here's a phenomenon or a pattern we know remarkably little about that impacts just about everything we're interested in as ecologists and evolutionary biologists in the sea. What I want to focus on for just a minute is a little bit of my own collaborative work with some of my former graduate students and postdocs on how mating systems influence patterns of relatedness within families and the evolution of parental care, sin conflict, and offspring size. So mating systems influence patterns of relatedness within families as many of you can intuitively understand. So in the simplest case, with a monogamous mating system shown here, where a single female is mated with a single male, all the parents will be equally related to all of their offspring by a coefficient of relatedness of 0.5, and all of the offspring in this clutch will be related to each other as full sibs, also by a coefficient of relatedness of 0.5. It's also important to know that the father in a monogamous mating system, the quote-unquote father, insofar as it's a truly genetically monogamous mating system, 
will also be the father of all those offspring. So both the maternal parent and the paternal parent are equally related to all the offspring. This guy is as confident of his parentage as she is of her parentage. But in a polyandrous mating system, like I've illustrated here, where females mated with multiple males, then we, in, first of all, we have a female who's equally related to all of her offspring, but none of the males may be certain of their true paternity in this clutch. And also the clutch will consist of a mixture of offspring that are full sieved with each other and half sieved with each other. And so this variation in patterns of relatedness between parents and offspring and among offspring generates a whole series of potential conflicts of interest over investment in oneself and conflicts between sibs and their, uh, between parents and each other, that's called sexual conflict, between parents and offspring over parental investment. Offspring always want more investment in themselves, all else being equal, because they're perfectly related to themselves than in their brothers or their brothers or sisters because they're related to their, them, full, full brothers or sisters by 0.5, Half brothers or sisters by 0.25. This is, by the way, for those of you who don't know, that's me trying to get more from my mom than she actually I'm not. She's probably feeding me some awful stuff. And then also, there's SIV conflict, as I just mentioned, over parental investment. And the SIV conflict over parental investment is obviously going to be higher if siblings are half siblings as opposed to full siblings. And the mating system determines all of these patterns of relatedness. So in a highly monogamous mating, systems, mating system, paternity confidence is high, paternal care is high, sexual conflict should be low, sin conflict and paternal offspring conflict should be low. In a polyandrous mating system, basically the opposite should be true. Now, many marine scientists have avoided talking about this issue because they think the opportunities for interactions between males and females, between parents and offspring and among offspring, is remarkably limited in most marine systems. And in fact, the vision you know, that people have in their heads is something like this. This is what dispersing offspring look like. They're gone, their brothers and their sisters are a long ways away from each other. Stephen is grinning at me because we actually know better. But in fact, 30 seconds earlier, this is what this brood actually looked like. And we know from work that Richard Strathman and his collaborators have done, and a variety of other people, that they're actually really crappy places to be in this egg mass in terms of developmental rate and vulnerability to predation, and they're better places to be. And we don't know whether or not there's conflict going on between siblings in that egg mass, because we don't know whether or not, in fact, in most cases, that egg mass consists of all full sieves, a mixture of full sieves and half sieves. We simply don't know in most cases. And I also want to just briefly point out that there are many opportunities because many marine organisms package their offspring together for there to be parent-offspring conflict and sibling conflict in the marine environment, not just in terrestrial systems. So I briefly want to tell you about a little work that I've done over the last 10 years with a variety of collaborators on an amazing system of parental care and sibling conflict in a marine snail called Selena Stira macrospira. In Selena Stira macrospira, um, individual snails often carry full loads of egg capsules. And in those egg capsules, there are usually two to 300 developing embryos. After about 25 to 30 days, just a few embryos actually persist. They've cannibalized their siblings, and a few crawl away larvae, or a few crawl away hatchlings emerge and begin their lives, and if they're lucky, they grow into adults. Now, the first question we wanted to answer is, who's carrying these egg capsules? And as it turns out, uh, males exclusively carry the egg capsules in this species. Females never do. Males have a very conspicuous penis that they wear on their right shoulder, and it's very easy to sex these guys. So never have we seen a female ever carry any egg capsules. It's only the males. So why are the males doing the parental care? And you'd expect it was because they're the genetic fathers of those offspring, and they have some benefit to doing it. Okay. So in terms of sib conflict inside these egg capsules, you can see that there's a remarkable amount of adelphophagy. That is, this is an egg capsule that was newly, newly detached by a female, and about three or four, two or three days late, four or five days later, there's a huge amount of asymmetry. Some of the early offspring have succeeded in eating a few of their siblings. They've grown much more quickly, and they will eventually consume all or most of their sibs within those egg capsules. 
And if we look at the relationship between the mating system and the cannibalism rate within an egg capsule, we can see that the more patrol lines there are within an egg capsule, the greater the cannibalism rate within that egg capsule. Likewise, so as patrilineal diversity increases and relatedness decreases within egg capsules, cannibalism rate increases. And also, obviously, as cannibalism rate increases with the number of patrol lines, the number of emerging hatchlings decreases. And consequently, hatchling size increases. So here there's a very strong effect of the mating system on rates of cannibalism and offspring size and offspring size variation. But one of the big questions here is, in fact, most males, as it turns out, are actually not the fathers of the offspring that they're carrying. So why are they carrying around in the first place? And we don't know the answer to that. So we very rarely know why and if there is, why there are the existing patterns of parental care in most marine organisms. And we know very little about all of the causes of offspring size variation. But clearly, mating systems have the potential to now I want to briefly talk about something I know very little about, but I'm really intrigued about, and that's the impacts of microbiomes on the nutritional niche of brain organisms in general, and nigerians in particular. I just want to say microbial partners modulate the nutritional ecology of tons and tons of marine organisms, and they also affect traits like developmental mode, behavior, immunological responses, susceptibility to pathogens, thermal and physiological tolerance, and speciation perhaps. And some of the classic examples that you all know about are relationships between Nigerians and their symbiome, including um, Zochlorelli and Symbiodinium, and then the relationships between, for example, these rift worms and their symbionts that provide basically the whole trophic metabolism for the holobion. And also there's some remarkable partnerships between worms like this and these oligarchy worms and a variety of bacterial partners that allow them to thrive in without mouths or guts. Yet we hardly know anything about the identities of the interactors in most of these mutualistic or at least symbiotic relationships. And we know very little about how that partnership and the impacts of particular partnerships vary in space and time. So um, the scale of adaptation in Nigerians and the significance of the whole line has been apparent really ever since some beautiful work by Rob Rowan and Nancy Nolan almost 20 years ago now on patterns of variation in the distribution of symbiome, of, of symbiodinium within and among coral heads. And they were able to show quite nicely with some very crude molecular tools by today's standard that there is zonation within individual coral heads of particular strains of, of particular clades at that time, what we now know to be clades of symbiodinium. And they vary in space and time. You can topple coral heads and shift the distribution of the composition of the symbiodinium symbiome. And that, of course, then raised a whole bunch of questions about the role of the symbiome in conferring local adaptation. At what scale does it confer local adaptation? And um, this is a map of the distribution of three species of Anthophora along the west coast of North America. And this problem came to my attention because I, as many of you know, I spent much of my career working on organisms that have very limited dispersal potential and an obviously high potential for local adaptation. And then working with one, my, one of my current graduate students, Brendan Cornwell, I started becoming interested for different reasons and with a former postdoc, Kathy McFadden, on the distribution of genetic variation in Anthopleura elegantissima. And Anthopleura elegantissima has an incredibly broad latitudinal distribution extending from really southern Baja, California, all the way out to the end of the Aleutians, I should just say. Um, we had a discussion last night, what I call the Pierce line. This is another species, Anthopleura sola, and the map here shows them extending up in Oregon, but maybe or maybe not, according to John and Vicky and a variety of other people. Okay. So here's the problem. In Anthopleura elegantissima, for example, as well as Anthogramma consola, this show, these plots show maps of the distribution of genetic variation across space. And there's very little genetic structure in any of these species across their ranges. And yet their ranges span a huge amount of environmental variation on broad scales from Alaska to southern Baja, California, as well as on microenvironmental scales. So how does a species with extensive gene flow manage to live across so many environments and so many degrees of latitude and such a very thermal and light regime? 
And the answer certainly became clear that it has something to do with their symbiote. And in 2000, um, Todd Lejeunesse and uh, Bob Trench published a nice paper in which they took the core symbiont, the core dinoflagellate symbiont, Symbiodinium, and recognized actually that there are two distinct species, Symbiodinium muscatinii and Symbiodinium californicum, that inhabit Anthropura elegantissima. There's also Lipochorus marina, um, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. And if we look at the distributions, the geographic distributions of the two Symbiodinium species, this is what we see that Symbiodinium muscatinii appears to be distributed at least along the entire west coast of North, of Cali of, of North America up into Alaska. And Symbiodinium californium, californicum appears to have a southern distribution, potentially reflecting a higher thermal tolerance and a higher thermal optimum than muscatinium. And then I'm not going to talk about the lipid right now and their distributions in San so that's what we thought the picture. Two species, that was local adaptation, and that was that. And then John Sanders and Steve Palumbi developed a whole new set of molecular tools, and in fact, they were able to show that Symbiodinium muscatini in 2011 actually consists of a bunch of different lineages or clonal lineages, each of which appears to have a relatively restricted geographic distribution, suggesting that there may be I don't know how many different specialized strains of Symbiodinium distributed across the range of Anthropora elegantissima. And we don't know, in fact, whether or not, because we're just developing the molecular tools that have been incredibly challenging to develop in Symbiodinium, about how those species, how, how finely divided the Symbiome is in Anthropora elegantissima, and the extent to which across microenvironments or across entire clones, these different components of the Symbiome are spatially segregated and distributed to confer local adaptation on the whole of body. And then I just briefly want to mention two quick examples, and I'll, I will finish up today, I promise. Um, two quick examples of how microbiomes seem to play hugely important roles in transitions from land to sea and from sea to land. And I won't have any time to go through this, but one thing we know is that in whales, now in baleen whales, in a study that just came out last year, that the baleen whales host a unique microbiome, gut microbiome, and we know that because we can sample their poops. And we can really take apart, using transcriptomes and genomics, what the microbiome composition is. And what we know now is that in making the transition, essentially, from land to sea, that, in fact, the gut microbiome of most baleen whales reflects, in part, their phylogenetic ancestry of being derived from terrestrial herbivores but also the novel environment and their novel diet of eating a chitin-rich diet, which was ancestrally a cellulose-rich diet. So their microbiomes reflect both their phylogenetic history and their current um, eco ecological situation. And then there are lots of other beautiful examples where there are marine to terrestrial transitions that are in various stages of progress across a group of closely related organisms. So for example, in onscoid isopods, there are a group of Lygia isopods that, depending upon where you are in the range and what species you're talking about, are more or less terrestrial versus marine. And we now know from a little bit of preliminary work done by one of my former grad students, Renate Ergo, that in fact the symbioms of the terrestrial species, the more terrestrial species, are much more similar to each other than they are to the, the, the symbiome of the marine species. But we don't really know functionally what that means. We just know their identities are different. And the same is true, or may be true, in a group of crabs that are G. Carosimi crabs being studied by one of my current graduate students, Vicki Morgan, in which there are species that are more or less marine or terrestrial. And I think it's really important to ask the question, to what extent in making that transition, it's not just osmotic stress and desiccation stress, but a shift in diet that the microbiome actually allows them to do, that underlies some of these major ecological transitions that we've seen across the history. And then finally, if Jay will let me do that, I'm gonna skip over this. <coughs> I wanna briefly talk about and conclude with what I call the silent majority in the biology of rarity in the sea. I'm not talking about rare or endangered species, so a classic example of that would be the extirpation, essentially, and the functional extinction of white abalone and anthropogenic, anthropogenic aliophics where humans essentially have decimated the populations, as you can see here, the price per pound of white abalone, well, there is no price per pound of white abalone 
have them. Um, and we have essentially, by having cool little parties, because people used to have them on the beaches in Southern California, and harvesting and drying the shelves, we decimated them. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about, I'm going to skip over this because I've already talked about that. I'm talking about species that have been chronically and evolutionarily rare over long periods of time, long before humans have affected their population dynamics. And what I briefly want to wind up with is just saying that when wind and water mediated um, fertilization precludes local rarity in most sessile plants and animals, on land and in air, rapid locomotion, because of the physical nature of the medium, is relatively energetically cheap. Visual and chemical signals involved in mate and resource location can travel quite far. And specialization, sound being an exception, by the way. Um, specialization on scarce resources becomes, I think, physically much more plausible in terrestrial and aerial environments than it is in the sea. And that, in turn, has allowed animal-mediated gamete transfer for terrestrial organisms to find mates so that they can be sessile and locally rare. And I think it's a much bigger challenge in the sea. And so how do truly rare species in the sea persist? How do they find mates when there are no pollinators in the sea? How do truly rare species persist over evolutionary timescales in the face of demographic and environmental stochasticity? How do chronically rare species respond to spatially and temporally varying selection? And are they more susceptible to extinction in the face of changing environments? And what can we learn about sustaining biodiversity from chronically rare species? We actually know a lot of terrestrial environments, but we know virtually nothing in marine environments. So how can we use molecular tools to distinguish chronic rarity from what we call endangerment? And the answer is using coalescent models. We can use them on a whole variety of next generation sequence data, either long strands of sequences that we've assembled, or much shorter strands from SNPs to multi-SNP haplotypes. And we can use a variety of coalescent models cast in these Bayesian frameworks to reconstruct from the current distribution of genetic variation the demographic history of a population. And you can see in all of these examples, population size, doesn't matter what approach you're using, is declining through time. And one of the classic examples here, of course, and this is working backwards through time, so this is long ago, this is the present, is to see a skyline plot that looks something like this for Arabian <coughs> Sea humpback whales, where in fact the current population size is extraordinarily small. But no one is taking the approach of using this same kind of methodology to ask whether or not species like Acropora rhodomana, which is arguably, by some people's account, one of the rarest, if not the rarest Acropora in the world, one of the rarest marine invertebrates. No one has actually asked the question about whether or not these species have been chronically rare over long periods of evolutionary history. And until we have those data, we're not going to really be able to answer the question of why patterns of biodiversity are so different in terrestrial versus marine situations, and how to conserve much of the biodiversity in the most diverse marine ecosystems, because we know so little about the natural history of rare species. And then we've only just begun to look at the small stuff, which may be running the whole show. So that's it. Um, I think we need to pay more attention to marine mating systems if we're going to understand how life histories evolve in the sea, how patterns of diversity occur, what mechanisms of speciation, what gametes evolve, how they evolve the way that they do. We need to understand a huge amount about microbiomes and holobiomes using genetic tools to unravel the details of the ecological interactions and the identities of the interactors. And finally, we need to study more the silent majority if we're really going to make progress on preserving biodiversity in the sea. Just want to thank my colleagues and collaborators who have contributed to this. Gary Vermeer should be on this photo, and I inadvertently left him off. Thank you very much.